Well, you get to listen to me again. I don't know if that's good or bad for you guys, but oh well. Um, I can't. I can't talk with that thing there. Do what? I think this will be okay. You want to race a little bit? Yeah. Okay, can you guys hear me in the back? Is that okay? All right, so um, this is going to be a, a tale of, of poultry poo, and um, it was a very interesting experience. And we're still, this is something that we're still working on, but the um, actual litigation that led to this, um, the development of our, what we call our poultry litter biomarker was, was truly an, an interesting case. So I wanted to say a little bit about poultry production and how much um, of this occurs and how much waste gets generated. So um, pardon me, but these numbers, I, I just looked these numbers up as, as I was making the talk, so I'm not really familiar with them. So. I'm going to have to look a little bit. Um, so poultry production has been increasing in the U.S. Uh oh, there we go. Um, over the last, steadily increasing over the last decade. So from um, 1990 to 2010, we have broilers up 47% to 8.6 billion birds in 2010. The highest producing states are Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Mississippi and North Carolina, but in fact, Texas was ranked sixth, so just after all those, in uh, broiler production, so producing 3.6 billion pounds of, um, of bird in 2010. So this is a pretty, pretty big um, agricultural effort. In 2008, um, meat and eggs were valued at $2.1 billion, and I do have some listed in the, in the back, um, I do have some sources for, for some of these um, data. And um, broilers and turkeys were produced on 800 contra contract farms in Texas. So this is definitely not an insignificant effort. Now, as far as um, what's in this poo, well, we have um, lots of E. coli, about 1,200 um, colony forming units per gram of poultry litter. So poultry litter is basically made up of um, materials like rice hulls. And this is what the birds grow up on from the time that they're uh, placed as chicks in the houses and, and then nurture it along until they um, you know, become fit for your dinner table. And um, so this is soiled poultry litter. And th these, this number came from samples that we processed as part of this um, litigation effort that I'll tell you about more about in a second. Um, enterococci, even higher concentrations, almost 50-fold higher at 51,000 per gram of poultry litter. And you know, a gram is, you know, looks like that much. So you can imagine like how much is in these houses. Um, we have Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter jejuni, all, both of which cause acute gastroenteritis and can, can even le lead to more severe um, symptoms like Guillain-Barre. We have Salmonella enterica, our, our good friend that we talked about earlier. And then pathogenic E. coli strains like 015787. 7, all that, that's, that's not really commonly found in poultry feces, but certainly these guys up here are. So there's some cool examples of poultry poop. I actually found a website that had lots of pictures of poultry poop. I was really excited. <laughs> and there's a lot of this, um, this stuff that gets deposited. So up to 0.5 pounds of um, soiled litter are produced per pound of, of meat. So you're getting a lot of production of this, you know, of this, this, this um, poop, poop stuff. That, um, so 340 tons annually from a farm, a small farm with only four poultry houses. That would be a relatively small um, sort of commercial farm. And here's just an example of the poultry litter being read to, ready to be spread on fields. And so that's exactly what we do with it. Most of this litter is not composted except in terms of whatever composting that it goes through when it's sitting in the poultry houses. And most of it is simply um, shoveled out of the poultry houses, placed in uh, large trucks, and then um, spread on fields. And the um, justification for doing that is that it contributes nitrogen to the fields and you know, so it acts as a fertilizer, which is true in many cases, however, in many cases, as, as, as um, you can find out from a little perusing of the literature, this material is spread irregardless of whether the fields actually need more nitrogen and or phosphorus. So um, the land, this is called land application. 
and about 1.6 billion kilograms per year of this soil poultry litter is um, land applied in the U.S., across the U.S. And a lot of it is done, I mean, of course it's done in Texas, it's done in Oklahoma, it's done in Arkansas, uh, in Georgia, North Carolina, all of these states where there's um, major poultry production. And so in addition to those bacteria that I showed you, there's also a lot of, as I mentioned, phosphate and nitrogen, which can contribute to eutrophication in water bodies, um, heavy metals like arsenic and copper and zinc included in there, and then the bacterial component. So I became um, involved as a consultant in this lawsuit, which was initiated by the Oklahoma Attorney General, Drew Edmondson, in 2005. And um, he sued 13 poultry integrators. Now, the integrators are the, um, basically the business end of poultry. And they actually tell the farmers um, what to, how many chickens they can have in a house, how to grow them, what to feed them. I mean, they supply the feed. So these integrators are, you know, they're basically, they're, they're basically controlling every aspect of the industry. They, they, they instruct the farmers on how to dispose of the, of the litter. They do the, you know, biosafety controls and all this sort of stuff. So um, these integrators, including Tyson, were sued in federal court. And the basis of the lawsuit was that, that the um, Oklahoma Attorney General contended that, th that these um, growers, and this is, this is, uh, these dots are showing some of the poultry houses in the, on the Arkansas side of the um, watershed in question, that this poultry activity in Arkansas and Oklahoma was degrading water quality in the Illinois River watershed. And you can see, and again, this, I'll, I'll show you another slide in a second that shows the, in, the, the poultry um, impacts on both sides of the border. This is just showing the houses in Arkansas. But what you can see really is that this is, these, this is the um, Illinois River and its tributaries. And you see how it's a, it's a, it's a network of, of, um, of, of wa water bodies and tributaries throughout this area. And yet the poultry litter is being land applied. Not only is it extensively, um, extensively um, uh, interfaced by surface water structure or surface waters, but also this whole area is a karst, um, a, a karst under, under, under stratum. And so this is very porous, it has a lot of holes in it, and so material that's spread on the surface can also be um, contributed readily to the groundwater. And so um, in the Illinois River is a um, it's considered a, um, an Oklahoma scenic water. It's very important for recreation. So you can kind of see some of the reasons why this, um, this became such a contentious issue of the degradation of water quality, again, with the contention that it was, um, in, in some measure, this, these activities of applying poultry, land applying poultry litter. So <clears throat> in the process of working through um, how to best demonstrate that poultry feces was affecting water quality because as we've, if we've already discussed, E. coli and fecal coliforms and neurococci can come from many different animal sources. And so part of my job was to come up with a um, marker for chicken and turkey fecal contamination. Now, none, none existed at the time, and so um, I worked with Jennifer Wiedis, who at the time worked at Northwind Laboratory and who's now at West Virginia University. And we, I'm not gonna go too much in the, into the details of how we, how we developed the, um, this library independent method, except to say that we used, um, for those of you who are more on the science end directly, we used terminal restriction fragment length polymorphism of DNA that um, had been amplified by PCR using either bacterial primers, 16S RNA. We also used um, E. coli primers to try and find a target. But basically what we settled upon was a, um, a fragment that came from our TRFLP library, which we cloned and sequenced. It was present in um, large concentrations in both um, soil samples that came from areas where poultry litter had been land, land applied, and it was also present in large concentrations in the contaminated poultry litter. So we were actually looking for a marker not directly from the chicken butts. We weren't looking for something that came right in the poop. 
but something that would that would survive in the soiled litter and also in the soil for some period of time. So we were not specifically interested in again something that was at high concentration, you know, only in the feces because that could have died off rapidly. So at any rate, what we what we did identify was a um, was a fragment of the 16S rRNA gene from a Brevibacterium species, and we determined that by DNA sequencing of these um, TRFLP fragments. And when we determined the sequence and blasted it, we did this blast analysis against the NCBI huge database of all sequences, it was not coming up against the, it was, it was not showing up in feces of any other types of animals that were included in this database. So we then started developing the quantitative PCR method and testing the sensitivity and specificity of the marker as I've, as I've told you about previously. So um, remember I showed you that kind of backwards graph that, that occurs in quantitative PCR where you've got the negative slope. And so this is just showing you the, the, a standard curve generated for what we call the LA35 Brevibacterium marker. So when you hear me say, see, hear me say LA35, that's this Brevibacterium marker. So you can see it has a, a nice standard curve, you know, better than 99% better than, um, R squared and with a, um, with a good efficiency. So we are happy with this with the standard curve. And this um, figure right here shows a graph of, um, this is CT value, in other words, so remember that, that a high CT value means a low concentration, and versus a concentration of litter. So we actually, um, we actually utilized soiled litter samples, you know, with all of its poop and et cetera, and we diluted that litter out. And this is just sample A and sample B. We always, we were working with two, two different samples. And so what you can see then is that there's a good correlation between the, um, the marker concentration and the dilution of the litter. So we're just, we're, we're just working through, okay, so are we gonna have a quantitative relationship between, between the amount of litter that we're analyzing versus the um, qPCR method? Now, this is a huge table. Don't um, get intimidated by it. It's basically showing you our sensitivity and specificity testing. And so if you look up to toward the top, you see the poultry and, and the litter samples, and we tested both fecal samples and litter samples. And what I want to direct you to is that when, where we have soil litter samples, so we, d we tested 10 composite samples from Oklahoma, and we found the marker in all of them. Um, here's poultry litter from Georgia. We tested seven of those and found our marker in seven of those. Now the clean litter is important. This was a control. This is litter that had not been pooped on by chickens. And if you go across and look at the clean litter, I'm having a little bit of trouble following across here, but there was, we tested three samples and we had a marker in zero of them. So again, sensitivity and specificity testing, we needed to test this clean litter to make sure that it wasn't showing up with the marker. And then if you follow down the column, you'll see lots of non-target samples like, um, oh, let me point out that turkey, we found, we did find it in um, turkey samples as well as in um, uh, turkey, turkey litter samples as well as in chicken samples. And then we have some of our non-target um, types that we directed our marker against. And all, in almost all cases, we had um, no cross-reactivity. Now, one thing that we did find is that in a couple of wastewater treatment plant influence, we found very low levels of the marker. And we also found in um, one duck and one goose composite sample, we did find the marker. So it does have a low rate of cross-reactivity, certainly with um, duck and goose feces. But the, um, the human, the, the finding of low concentrations in wastewater influent, we would attribute to, you know, people washing the um, poultry and then, and then potentially disposing of material in their sinks, et cetera. And again, this was at such a low level that it wasn't really an issue in terms of the utility of the method. So um, another thing that we were looking at in this testing of this LA35 marker was to to what extent does the marker in the in the poultry litter correlate with fecal indicator bacteria because in the Illinois River as in all of these all recreational waters we're using fecal indicator bacteria as our you know as our surrogate for pathogens and so it was important that we have some sort of a um, of a connection and what we found was that 
Wait, so this is the, um, on this axis we have the amount of the LA35 marker concentration, and on this axis we have the um, uh, amount of either E. coli or enterococcus. And these white circles are enterococcus, and so you can see that for enterococci, we had a very strong correlation. In fact, I think the R squared was about 0.75 between the marker and enterococci. Interestingly, for E. coli, that relationship fell apart to a good, a good, a good extent. And keep in mind that this is this is actually in the poultry litter. So, good correlation for enterococci in the litter, but not so much for um, for E. coli. Now. <clears throat> That was, what I showed you there was really the basis for the first, pa first paper that we published, and that was published in the Journal of Applied Microbiology in 2009. If, if anybody wants a copy of the paper, I'll be happy to send you a PDF. Now, this part of the talk, I'm going to be um, talking about our second paper, and that was published in Applied Environmental Microbiology in 2011. And so what you see here, again, um, this might look a little bit familiar, hopefully. This is the map of the Illinois River watershed. And again, note the extensive um, amount of surface waters running through here. And here's the Arkansas-Oklahoma border with Arkansas over here and Oklahoma over here. This is Lake Tinkiller, a very famous recreational lake whose quality has really been degraded by, um, by the nutrients coming down the, uh, the tributaries into the lake, the river and the tributaries. And then what you see here are um, in all of these samples are where all, all of these dots are where we tested for the poultry litter marker in this watershed. And all of the circles are the ones where we had positives and the triangles are the, are the ones where we had um, negatives. And we were actually able to correlate the positive samples with the mean distance from a um, poultry rearing facility. Now, if we look at the concentration of the LA35 marker in various types of environmental samples, um, this graph's a little bit confusing, but the bars represent different types of samples. So here's the soil litter. Litter application areas, that means fields on which litter was, uh, had been applied, that we know that it had been applied the within the last year. Edge of field runoff, this is like when you have a storm and the, and, the, um, and the water runs off the field and we collected water from the ditches. And then we have um, river samples, we have lake samples, we have um, groundwater samples, and so these are actually well samples where this is groundwater. And then we have springs. So in that area, because of this karst um, substratum and the amount of, um, of water in, the, you know, in that area, there's a lot of springs. And actually people take their water jugs to springs and fill them up and you know, they think that it's, very, that it's very healthy. But I have news for them, because their springs are contaminated because of the car substratum and what they what they spread. So, and it's not just, it, and I have to say it's not just poultry either, there's a lot of cattle rearing in that watershed as well, and that, that does make a contribution. Um, so on this y-axis here, we have the um, concentration of the um, LA35 marker um, per gram of litter, and over here we have the um, percentage of samples that were analyzed containing the marker. And so if you look at these little triangles here, they're showing you what percent of each type of sample contained the, the marker. And then the bar itself shows you the, constant, the average concentration of the marker that we found. So here's the average concentration in poultry litter. And then we here's this triangle up here. So we found it in 100% of these samples in the Illinois River watershed. In the litter application areas, we found it in, see this triangle up here, so the concentration's not so high because, again, some of these fields would have had there been applied up to a year previous. So the concentration's not nearly as high, but you can see that we found it in 80% of the samples and so on. So even in the most protected types of samples, the groundwater samples, we've, we were able to find the marker only in, only in about 10% of the samples, but we still found it. And in the springs, again, where people are collecting water and taking it home and it's not treated at all, then we're finding it in about 40% of these samples. So you can see that it's pretty, the LA35 marker for poultry litter is pretty, ubiquitous, pretty ubiquitously distributed in the, in the watershed. And there's the, um, there is the citation for that work. And again, I'll be happy to send you the PDF if you're curious. Now, here we have, um, this, these graphs might be a little bit confusing, but all they're really showing you is the relationship between the concentration of fecal indicator bacteria 
and the concentration of the LA35 marker over here. And this is in uh, gene copies per, um, per milliliter of water. And you see pretty strong relationships for um, fecal coliforms, for enterococcus, and for E. coli. So in these water samples, we're seeing um, nice strong relationships for all of these indicator bacteria. And we've actually, in the graphs, they look a little confusing because we've actually, we've actually defined which samples are river water, the triangles, which ones are groundwater, and which ones are edge of field runoff. But it's not really necessary to um, look at that to, to parse out the totality of what you're seeing here, which is this correlation in the indicator bacteria with the, um, with the LA35 marker in these water samples. And I have to say that in these graphs, we only used water samples in which the um, marker was detected. So in ones that, where it wasn't detected, we didn't, or where we didn't have culturable indicator bacteria, we didn't include those samples in the, uh, in the graph. Would have been too, too confusing. Okay, so now I mentioned that there's heavy metals that are associated with these, um, with these, back to, with these uh, um, poultry litter rearing operations and including copper. There's a lot of uh, phosphorus, nutrient, arsenic, and zinc. And so once again, you see the correlation. Here's the concentration of the, um, of the inorganic material and here's the concentration of the marker over here. And once again, you see um, strong positive correlations here, the marker with copper, with phosphorus, with zinc, and with arsenic in these Illinois River waters. So um, Jennifer and I have, have um, been applying for an NSF grant, and we're hoping that the third time is a charm. Um, the second time we submitted it, it was highly recommended for funding, but there wasn't enough money uh, to fund it. But just to let you know kind of what's on the horizon, so um, Jennifer's designed a nice um, TACMAN um, method for, and, and hoping the, the real, there's, there's two, Two reasons. Well, the, the big the big reason for designing the TACMAN essay was in the hopes that we could that we could eliminate the cross reactivity with the um, duck and the goose species, and we haven't really gotten far enough along in our testing to know if we've done if we've done that yet. But when you use a TACMAN method as opposed to a cyber green, and I, I know this is a bit of a technicality, but it may be useful to you at some point. Um, the TACMAN essay includes a probe, and that allows you to have much much greater specificity, and potentially have much greater specificity in the method than if you just use the two primers for specificity the way you would with something like a cyber green PCR. Um, so basically, trying to make the method um, more specific and also maybe a bit more sexy for NSF. It's like, come on, guys, haven't we done enough? And then um, here's the standard curve from the um, that she's just preliminary data from the TACMAN essay. So um, that uh, hopefully I've shown you a you know that we do have a good poultry litter um, good marker for poultry contamination. Um, I also need to say that this this work was validated um, in a um, actually in Mike Sadowski's lab with blind samples. So we actually sent him blind samples that he where he didn't know whether they were contaminated with poultry litter or not, and was able to successfully identify those. And we've also done a lot of work with. Um, Jorge Santa Domingo at EPA over the last year, and um, they've also shown that the this LA35 marker is um, more more sensitive and more specific than any of the markers that they've been working on. So, if any of you have a poultry problem, I can recommend this sucker. So maybe we have time for questions.